It is my color. Hi, hi, turn on. Okay. Okay, Stephen, we'll get started. Okay, perfect. You're you're good to go. I see attendees in here. Um, yes. Okay, we on? Yes, you're good to go. Okay, uh, evening everybody. Um, I'm Jason Moniz, I'm a program manager for the Animal Disease Control Branch with the Hawaii Department of Agriculture. And uh, we're on Zoom for those who couldn't make the meeting and then uh, with you guys. So I'll just, I'm gonna go through a, a PowerPoint presentation, give some history on bovine tuberculosis specifically to, to Molokai and then start going over some of the recent cases. We had a couple of meetings before, so some of these cases, if you went to the meeting, you're gonna hear repeat, yeah? And then we'll go through the more recent cases and then uh, kind of conclude after that and then do questions and answers, yeah? So again, we're talking about bovine tuberculosis um, and uh, 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 update on a uh, outbreak. Can I hear? Maybe me, I just, I can't hear. So just please hit the mic a little bit closer. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go to a outbreak. Yeah, update um, for bovine tuberculosis. Uh, okay, go ahead, Stephen. So a little bit on the history of bovine tuberculosis on Molokai. We have historical evidence of bovine tuberculosis being on Molokai from around the 1940s. In the past, other islands were also infected, but eventually were cleaned up. Uh, Molokai continues to have a problem. Uh, multiple, we have seen multiple outbreaks between 1940 and 1985, mainly on the east end of Molokai. And historically, Molokai axis deer, feral pigs, and mongoose have have also been found to be infected with bovine tuberculosis. Infections in mongoose and feral pigs are typically found close, closely associated with infected cattle herds. And infections in, infections in axis deer were more sporadically located in very low numbers uh, from 1960 to 1981. Only five infected axis deer were detected on Molokai, all on the east end of the island. 1985, bovine tuberculosis was uh, detected in central Molokai, uh, that was in uh, Molokai Ranch. Uh, complete island depopulation occurred between 1985 and 1986, over 9,000 head uh, were sent to slaughter to try to eradicate uh, bovine tuberculosis from Molokai. At that time, it was thought that once infected cattle herds uh, were removed, infection in wildlife would die out. And Molokai remained free of cattle for one year after the complete depopulation, then repopulated with steers only for a second year. And when all the steers were slaughtered and found free of bovine tuberculosis, breeding cattle were tested negative for bovine tuberculosis and were allowed to be restocked. Herds were retested 12 months after being restocked. Mokai remained free of bovine tuberculosis until 1997 when a single cow from Moalapui was found infected at slaughter. The infected herd was depopulated, it was about 400 head, with no additional animals with lesions detected. 5,000 head of cattle were, were tested on East and Central Mokai and Maui where, were tested and all found negative in this investigation. So after the cattle herd was depopulated in 1997, we began a wildlife survey. Uh, it was conducted initially island-wide and focused on the east end of Molokai. And that took place between 1998 and 2012. That period of time, we tested 682 feral swine and 20 were found infected. All the infections were found between Kamalo and Mapaleo. 
So basically that was two miles east and two miles west of where the infected cattle herd was in 1997. 477 samples of axis deer were tested and none were found infected. 81 samples of feral goats were tested, none were found infected. And 61 pooled samples of mongoose, when we say pooled, we probably put samples together from about half a dozen mongoose each, 61 pools, none were infected. That after the 97 outbreak, annual testing was um, conduct, conducted and we tested cattle herds on the east end of Molokai annually uh, between 1997 all the way up to 2021. And no infected east end herds were detected in those 25 years. Cattle were skin tested. We do what's called a cattle fold test. That's the initial test that we do. And if we have any response to the cattle fold test, we do a second test called a comparative cervical test. And if the comparative and um, if, if we had any responses to the cattle fold, no suspects or reactors to the, to the comparative cervical tests were detected in 25 years. In addition, cattle slaughtered at the Molokai Cooperative slaughter plant or any other plant throughout the state where Molokai cattle would have been sent to are routinely inspected for bovine tuberculosis lesions and none were detected over 25 years. An agreement in place with USDA called for the East End cattle being tested annually or within 30 days before movement in order for the state of Hawaii to maintain its free status for bovine tuberculosis. A little bit of general information about bovine tuberculosis. It's a chronic bacterial disease of animals caused by members of a mycobacterium tuberculosis complex primarily caused by Mycobacterium bovis. It is a major zoonotic disease. Zoonotic means that it can spill over and infect humans. And cattle are the main source of infection for humans. It also affects other domestic animals such as sheep, goats, horses, pigs, dogs, cats, and wildlife species such as wild boars, deer, and antelope. The name tuberculosis comes from nodules called tuber tu tubercles which form in the lymph nodes and other tissues of affected animals and humans. Although the infection in cattle herds have been controlled in most countries, complete elimination of the disease is complicated by a persistent infection of wild animals, such as the European badger in the United Kingdom, white-tailed deer in parts of the United States, and brush-tailed possum in New Zealand. Bovine tuberculosis remains a serious problem for animals and human health in many developing countries. In the US, archeological evidence has found TB in the bones of bison in Wyoming that, were, that was 17,000 years old. It's been around a while. So now we come to um, the recent outbreak um, in June, 2021. Uh, in central Molokai. So Kalapana, uh, Kaliohumalo's herd moved from central Molokai to Mapuleo due to drought in December 2020 uh, through March and June of 2021. Caught a full test required to return to central Molokai from Mapuleo it began in March but was aborted because of bad weather and inability of the uh, state veterinary medical officer to fly back in to Molokai to complete the test. 60 days are required before the cattle fold test can be, re, can be reapplied. The herd was out of feed at Mapuleo and was allowed to return to central Molokai under quarantine, a quarantine or hold order. The herd retested in June, 2021. One reactor detected and sacrificed had lung lesions uh, found and diagnosed as bovine tuberculosis by the National Veterinary Services Laboratory. Genetic, genetic fingerprinting indicated that cow, cow's mycobacterium, the bacteria that was detected in cow, the DNA related to the DNA of the wildlife found on the east end of Molokai from the 1998 through 2012 survey. So this is a picture of what it looks like. Uh, the cows are restrained in a sheet 
and uh, that particular cow um, was um, one of 39 head in that herd. Um, and uh, that is an actual picture of the lesion in the lung. There was um, the lesion that was found in the lung of that cow. That herd was quarantined because of uh, that infection in July of 2021. It was uh, completely depopulated by September 3rd, 2021, and eventually seven infected animals, so six additional infected animals was found. Um, the quarantine was later rescinded in December 22, 2021, and this herd owner has not repopulated with cattle at this point. Uh, these herds, when they're depopulated, they're uh, purchased. Um, USDA tries to provide indemnity and purchase, purchases the cattle so that the owner um, has some funds coming back to them. Uh, it's not outright to just lose, lose the animal. So, um, so when we find this infected herd, um, what we do is we, um, we do what's called trace outs. Uh, trace outs mean have they sold cattle to any place else? And then we got to go test those herds that they might have sold into, and there were no trace outs. And then trace, we look at trace ins. So these are cattle that they purchase that have entered their herd. And we had cattle that was purchased from the uh, homestead, um, the Mokai homestead, and also from Puohoku. Both herds were tested, both herds tested negative. Then we look at contact herds, so herds that they have physical contact with. The contact herd, the coit herd was tested, it was tested negative. And uh, Haban uh, Pakala herd was tested and it tested positive, it was infected. And there was a goat herd, a Kelly herd was tested, they were tested negative. So, so this is just information we just went over. Uh, this little bit of information there on the bottom of um, uh, genetic information, DNA was sequenced and compared to all M. bovis isolates in the National Veterinary Services Laboratory database. And, and those cultures uh, shared the most recent common ancestors with the isolates from this outbreak with a group of wildlife isolates from Molokai. All animals were infected with the endemic Molokai strain. So it wasn't an infection that moved on to the island. It was um, uh, related to the same bacteria that we, were, we had been detecting from 97 through 2012 from the east end of Molokai. Um, yeah, so this is a picture of a, a cow in that herd that had been purchased from Pooku Ranch. And that is a very extensive infection. What you're looking at is, is underneath um, the head of that, that um, animal. Um, I don't really have a pointer. Yeah, I guess, can, does it show up the point? These are lymph nodes. These are very large lymph nodes. When you open those lymph nodes, this is what the material in the lymph node looks like. Okay, next. And this is a cow from Puhoku. Um, uh, it was probably the most extensively infected animal from this group. Uh, these, this is the lungs and these are abscesses in the lymph nodes that are associated with the lungs and also abscesses in the lungs, the lung itself. Okay. Um, more pictures from that bull from the homestead, originally from the homestead. Okay. So the uh, second infect Infected herd was a combination of on uh, Pakala, um, about 30 head. It was quarantined on September 1st. Uh, we did the cattle full test on this herd and uh, found uh, infection in this herd. Uh, the herd was completely uh, depopulated completely by October 6th. And there was a total of three infected animals in, the, in this, these herds. And the quarantine was rescinded December 22nd meaning the quarantine was lifted. And this herd actually did repopulate on January 10th, uh, 2022. This herd repopulated with cattle from 
uh, couple of day ranch and those cattle were tested negative um, and are scheduled for retest in about six months. This just gives you uh, some physical idea of where um, the cattle were um, held pending uh, the retests. So this is where the Kevu model herd was, the letter D, and I believe C, B, A was where the Havan Pakala cattle were. Uh, they also, the, that those the Pakala, Havan, and Kevu model all commingled as one herd prior to Kevu model going down to um, uh, Mapaleo. When he came back, they stayed separate, except for one, one boot that decided he wanted to go back and be part of the Habana and Pakala herd. Okay, next. Um, this is actually showing some swelling. This is actually a sheet that was associated with this, um, this cattle herd and it, it was actually put down and, look, and we looked for lesions because of this finding of the swelling and the, and the colorful tests and um, we did not find any lesions in the, in the sheet. This is a graph, the second test that we do, the uh, comparative cervical test. And here, what we do is we graph out the, the size of the response of, um, of the tuberculin response and, and uh, it gets put into a negative zone and a suspect zone and a reactive zone. So we had no animals in the reactive zone, but rather than wait and come back and retest this animal, we decided to purchase, uh, USDA purchased this animal in a suspect zone and um, it was put down and lesions were found in the animal. Next. And this is that animal that was in a suspect zone. This is a, actually a relatively small lesion in a lymph node um, in between the lungs, just where the trachea is and another small lesion in the lymph nodes that are associated with the digestive tract or the, the small intestine. Okay, next. Um, so the remainder of this herd went to slaughter, two additional, I think one additional animal was found at the slaughter plant and one additional animal was put down in the field and, and lesions were found in, in that animal. So again, three, three infected animals in this herd. And this herd was completely depopulated also. Okay, next. Uh, so both herds were completely depopulated with uh, federal indemnity through slaughter or, or being euthanized in the field. Uh, cleaning and disinfection of corrals, water troughs, gates all took place. Uh, 30 plus days downtime they actually went longer than 30 days before we rescinded the quarantine. Um, uh, again, as I mentioned, Kelly Malo has not repopulated and the Haban herd has repopulated with Kapulale cattle. Uh, repopulated cattle again were tested negative um, and then uh, retested scheduled for June and, and December of, of uh, this year. Uh, the source of the infection remains on the investigation, uh, the investigation of wildlife around Holehua and Mapolehu are important to complete and that's uh, beginning at this point. Uh, contact herds, um, we went over the contact herds, uh, decoit was tested, tested negative, the Cali gold herd was tested, tested negative. Next. Uh, this is an example of the results of the decoit herd. Uh, they had three animals that responded to the caudal fold test. All those animals fell in this negative zone. And so the test is uh, determined to be negative. Next. Uh, you know, can you back up on Stephen, please? Yeah, this down here, it's some if uh, Decoit had two heifers that um, jumped over the fence into the Caleb Model herd. And rather than taking those animals back and testing those animals, he sent those animals to slaughter. And the slaughter results were no goats lesions were, were detected in those two heifers. And that was a safer thing to do. Okay, next. Uh, this is a Kelly goat herd. Um, it, the, when the goats were tested, uh, there were eight caudal fold uh, responders and 
eight of the comparative uh, cervical tests were negative. Uh, there were two animals that were close to the suspect zone and owner and uh, veterinary medical officer decided to sacrifice those animals and look for lesions to, just to be safe. And no gross lesions were determined or were, were de um, discovered. Uh, samples were even without gross lesions were submitted to the National Veterinary Services Laboratory and they've, they've come back negative. Okay, next. Um, trace in, trace out herds to Kalamala and Haban. Again, we went, we went over this uh, already, but Fuhuku got a herd test negative in September 7th. Uh, the Molokai Home State Livestock Association got a herd test negative October 4th. And a tra trace out um, for uh, Haban and Pakala uh, from Burrito cattle and goats tested negative November 12, 2021. This is what the Pooku cattle herd test looked like uh, on September 7, 2021. 43A were tested with a cattle fold test. There were two cattle fold suspects, and this is the results of their comparative serum tests, both of them in the negative zone. Uh, Pohoku Ranch has been one of those ranches on the east end that has been tested negative, tested for the past 25 years, tested negative for the past 25 years. Go ahead. This is the Molokai Homestead Livestock Association. We have a bunch of um, colorful suspects and um, two, two of those um, colorful suspects, they were all, those 27 were retested with a comparative cervical test and two of those comparative cervical tests fell up in a suspect zone. And both of those were purchased and, and um, euthanized and um, necropsies were completed to see if we had an infected animal. Next. Uh, one of those animals had this abscess by its spleen. And this is what the abscess looked like. And uh, just looking at it, um, you couldn't determine whether there was bovine tuberculosis or not. It looks, looks like the right thing. The samples were sent off to the National Veterinary Services Lab and the results came back and we just had a run of the mill abscess. It was not compatible with bovine tuberculosis. So bottom line is, can't tell just like by looking sometimes whether you're dealing with bovine tuberculosis or, or not. Next. So that was pretty much the central Molokai, what I call the central Molokai outbreak um, involved two herds. It kind of made sense. The herd went down to the east end where we know we had um, persistent bovine tuberculosis, at least in feral pigs and came back to central Molokai with an infection infected um, the neighbor. So that's, that's the thought of how that infection occurred, but it's not, um, that's, that's not a definite. And um, I can kind of go over that later why we say it's not a definite. We'll go on to a second outbreak. So we thought we were done with this. And then November 10, uh, 2021, um, Donnelly's sent for a head of swine to slaughter at the Molokai Cooperative Slaughter Plant. And four of four swine were had lesions uh, compatible with bovine tuberculosis in the lymph nodes of the head of those four swine. Five additional swine were slaughtered at the farm and three of the five were infected with bovine tuberculosis. The initial four swine were confirmed as bovine tuberculosis by the National Veterinary Services Laboratory on November 16th. The herd was quarantined. This herd had swine, cattle, and sheep. They were all under quarantine from November 22nd, 2021. The swine herd was uh, depopulated completely on January 10th, 2022. That's about a hundred head of swine. Uh, we did not open every single carcass, but the ones we did, um, about 60, 70% of the older swine were infected and 0% of the younger swine were infected. So it's pretty interesting uh, outcome. 
The cattle herd was depopulated, um, minus one animal that we're still looking for from February, um, depopulated on February 16, 2022, and one animal was found to be infected. The sheep were depopulated by February 8, uh, 2022, and none of the sheep were infected. This is what the lesion looks like. This is the bottom side of uh, the head of, uh, um, of a pig. Um, this is the tongue. And you open up and look at the lymph nodes in this area. Has uh, one lymph node here, another lymph node there. Those are large lymph nodes with fairly classic looking uh, bovine tuberculosis, which then was um, proven to be bovine tuberculosis at the veterinary services laboratory. Uh, Donnelly, Trace, and Contact Herds. Uh, we had three cattle operations, uh, two contact and one trace out. Uh, two were, inf were found to be infected and one was found to be negative. Uh, we had eight swine operations. There were um, trace outs from the Donnelly herd. Uh, four, four of the swine operations had completely slaughtered their pigs and four swine operations are scheduled for deep depopulation. Okay, next. West End contact herds found infected um, Sakugawa. Uh, Mauna Loa herd was tested December 10, 2021. 199 head were tested and 12 were suspect or responded to the colorful test. Two of those 12 tested um, suspect on that second test that are compared to surgical tests. Both were sacrificed for diagnostic purposes and ghost lesions were found in both. Both confirmed that as bovine tuberculosis for, by the National Veterinary Services Laboratory. Uh, the herd was formally quarantined December 30, 21, and the herd is under the process of being depopulated by slaughter. In fact, uh, today we sent the first load of 48 head to a slaughter plant on Oahu. Um, West, another West End contact herd was uh, Mokai Ranch. Mokai Ranch was tested on January 11. 189 head were tested with the Cottiful test. There were 14 responders. And the 14 responders were tested with the second test compared to the surgical tests. And we had one out of the 14 that tested suspect. Uh, the suspect was sacrificed for diagnostic purposes and gross lesions were found in the lung and the lymph node that associated with the lung. It, that those um, lesions were confirmed to be bovine tuberculosis by the National Veterinary Services Laboratory. Herd was formally quarantined on January 27, 2022. The herd is being considered for either depopulation or testing removed to remove the infection. Next. Um, we have one small herd um, that was a, a trace out. Uh, they actually had acquired an orphan from the Donnelly herd and that um, they were tested on January 11th and none of the three animals that they had on their property responded to the cotton flow test. And they're scheduled for retest in July of 2022. West End contact herds found infected. Um, so the Sakugao Meyer Lake herd was considered to be in contact with their Molokai, um, with their Mauna Loa herd. It was tested in February 25th. And we had, out of 43 animals tested, we had seven that responded to the call full test. Of those seven that were tested with the uh, second test, a comparative surgical test, one tested suspect. It was sac sacrificed for diagnostic purposes and gross, le gross lesions were found and confirmed by the National Veterinary Services Laboratory to be bovine tuberculosis. The herd is formally quarantined on March 16, 2022. And the herd is being depopulated by slaughter. Um, when we send samples, and I don't know how well this thing shows up, but when we send samples to the National Veterinary Services Laboratory, 
um, we'll send the gross samples, we'll send some as, as frozen or chilled and the rest is, is in formula. They take those samples and then they do what's called a histopathology. They make um, real thin slices and they put special stains on them. And then they, they look at those um, samples under the microscope. Usually within two days of the sample arriving there, they'll call us back and they tell us that uh, those samples were either consistent and not consistent with what they call microbacteriosis. So, so it's a tentative diagnosis. Then we're waiting for another few days if they have enough DNA in those tissues that we sent them. Um, they'll do what's called a PCR test where they're looking at, they're looking for the DNA for that microbacterium. And at that point, if they find DNA that's consistent with mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, which includes bovis, includes mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is a tuberculosis that people typically get infected with, they'll make the diagnosis. We don't expect the cattle to be infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis. After that, they grow out the bacteria, the tissues that we send them either frozen or chilled, they're gonna grow it out. That takes up to eight weeks. So we're waiting for eight weeks to see if they grow it out. They grow it out and then they classify. They have ways of classifying the bacteria they grow out and they tell us what the genus and the species is. Genus being mycobacterium, species being bovis. And at that point, if they tell us we have mycobacterium bovis, that basically confirms what they did with the DNA test eight weeks previously. Once they do that, they'll have enough bacteria where they do a whole genome study. And a whole genome study, I can't say that I have my mind totally wrapped and understand it perfect, but we, we have a lot of help from, from the National Veterinary Services Laboratory. And the whole genome study starts telling us uh, a story about um, you know, where the bacteria might have been, who the ancestor of this bacteria is. So, so basically it's these whole genome studies that tell us that, uh, that this bacteria traces back to ancestors. Um, their ancestors were wildlife that we had sampled back between 1998 and 2012. So I think, you know, it, what it comes down to is how long they've been doing these genome studies and they can trace the, these outbreaks, all of the infected animals that we found so far, trace back to a feral pig that was sampled in 1999. And that was probably George Miller, who was probably the inspector that worked with us then that found that infected feral pig that a hunter brought into him. So these are some of the, um, the diagrams that they passed to us. And the, on this side here, on the left side, that's a whole tree of all the different mycobacteria that have been discovered. I think this is worldwide. Um, this one section here, there's an uh, infection that they pick up in Michigan. And here's Molokai over here that we have our own little branch. And um, all of the infections we've detected in, in Molokai have all fallen in this branch. It doesn't pop up any place else on this, on this tree. Uh, this slide just, this is a list of actually all, and I can't read it, it's too small. I can't really see what I'm looking at, but this is a list of, of the, um, the different cattle and things that we detected um, in these recent outbreaks on Molokai. And all it does is it traces back to that common, common ancestor. Okay, next. More fancy pictures they send us of uh, outbreaks and it just, it starts telling us uh, who's related to who. So the interesting thing that um, I, I guess there's some slides coming up and I'll just kind of tell you what we know from these genomic, uh, genomic testing. Go ahead, next slide. So this is what we know through the genome sequence sequencing uh, definitely that uh, detection since 2005 share a common ancestor with a 1995 feral pig from the East End of Molokai. All detections in the 2021 and 2022 outbreak are of the Molokai TB strain. And we can safely say they're not from a new introduction from outside of Molokai. Herd number one and herd number two. So that would have been, um, 
Kilimalu and the Haban herd uh, share a common ancestor. And then herd number three and herd number four, herd number three is Donley, herd number four is Sakugawa, share a common ancestor. And herd number three and herd number five, so again, that's Donley and now this time Mokai Ranch, also share a common ancestor. So it is kind of hard for me to wrap my head around is uh, typically when you see an outbreak, you try to associate it with, you know, one source. And what this genomic work is telling us right now is we may be looking at three separate outbreaks. So the, basically the Keumalu Haban herd is its own outbreak. It's not associated with the Donnelly herd. Donnelly's or Molkai Ranch or Sakugawa didn't get infected from, from either Keumalu or Haban. And the um, Donnelly pigs are related. Some of the Donnelly pigs were related to the, the bacteria that was also found on Molkai Ranch. And some of the Donnelly pigs are related to bacteria found in Sakugawa. So just looks like, looks like it's looking like three different outbreaks next. What we know through genomic sequencing, probably, there appears to be three different sources or introductions to the cluster in the current Molokai outbreak. The level of diversity in herds one and two, uh, the cluster suggests infection with, in this herd over a longer period of time. Uh, herd number four, it looks like there were possibly two different introductions into herd number four. So herd number four was the uh, Sakugawa herd. Herd number three, which is the Donnelly pigs and the one cow, looks like a recent infection due to lack of, lack of diversity and possibly a point source exposure. What point source exposure it means is it's looking like those pigs all got infected at the same time and it didn't go from pig to pig to pig to pig. And they all got it at the same time. So those are the, what we know and what uh, probably, um, and it's gonna need to be more testing, more work done before we get more definite answers. So what's next? Um, we need to determine the extent of, the, of this outbreak in livestock. Uh, we need to expedite livestock testing and depopulation or test and remove procedures of infected herds. So basically the purpose of the depopulation and the test and remove is to remove sources of infections for possible new, infe uh, new infected herds. Uh, we have two more trace or contact cattle herds associated with the infected West End herds that need to be tested. So they are being scheduled for testing and three swine herds with swine from the West End herd that uh, are in the process of uh, being depopulated. Uh, we also need to ramp up bovine tuberculosis testing of hunter collected wildlife um, carcasses. We did that between 1998 and 2012. We need to repeat that. Uh, we're trying to get funding so that we can provide incentive for Basically, we used to call it gas money for the hunters, you know, a little bit of money for them helping us out, bringing in samples. And um, in that uh, uh, previous um, collection uh, surveillance, we asked them to bring in the head and, uh, and what's called a pluck. So basically the trachea, the two lungs. And so we get all the lymph nodes that are associated with the lungs. We get the two lungs to look at and we get all the lymph nodes in the head. And those are the, the most common sites where we're gonna find the, the infection in these animals. If the, if the infection gets more extensive, it'll show up in different uh, organs, but those are usually the first two places we're gonna find it. Uh, we need to complete area testing. Uh, there's a whole set of uniform methods and rules that go along with finding TB or dealing with TB. And basically what you end up doing is drawing 10 mile radiuses around infected herds and test those herds. And we have enough infected herds and geographically spaced out now 
where basically we we're going to end up testing the whole island. And the east end has been tested annually anyway for the last uh, 25 years. It's the east end that's not involved right now with this outbreak, but central Molokai and west Molokai. And we're basically done with west Molokai, central Molokai, there's small operations that we're going to have to get tested. Next. So uh, about a week ago, we ended up uh, making a decision to quarantine the entire island of Molokai on a purpose. Uh, you know, what is it? It, it requires a, a permit from the state veterinarian to move livestock, feral animals, wild animals, not carcasses, but live animals. So prior to any movement, you need to get a permit. It's going to be basically, Gene is going to be the the primary contact uh, to issue permits. So we're going to evaluate the risk of moving animals before we issue a permit. It took place on April 8th. Um, and it, it, it will control the movement of animals to and from the island of Molokai. Uh, today, we permitted the movement of 48 head of what's called exposed cattle. These are negative, test negative animals from an infected herd. Uh, we permitted the, that movement to a slaughter plant on Oahu. Uh, tomorrow we follow with those cattle when they arrive on Oahu. We break a seal that we, we sealed the containers with a seal, break the seal, unload the cattle, clean and disinfect the holding pens. Those containers taken up to our quarantine station will be cleaned and disinfected out there. Um, we also control movement between farms, ranches, and any premises on Molokai. So basically what we're seeing, I mean, we know the herds that are infected, but we don't know the status of some of the other herds. And it seems like the more we look, the more we find in right now. So we'll make a decision whether it's safe to move uh, between farms and between ranches. And then we'll also issue a permit to move to slaughter. That should not be an issue. We will issue permits to move to slaughter. It has to be one way to kind of go to the slaughter plant and go back someplace else. Um, the, the permit to move to slaughter should be pretty automatic. We just want to keep track of who's moving to slaughter. So anyone needing to move animals, and we, again, these are live animals, not carcasses, need to get a permit. And the purpose is to prevent the spread of bovine tuberculosis to the rest of the state, to the nation, and farms and ranches um, locations on Molokai that are not infected. Okay, next. Um, is a legislative initiative and funding. There's a request for, um, for approval for funding for two positions uh, for Molokai. Um, right now, um, in my opinion, things are just moving too slow. Uh, we don't you know, we're not here on a full-time basis. We want to get another livestock inspe uh, inspector position to assist Gene and uh, actually a veterinary medical officer to be stationed, located on, on Molokai to go after the livestock testing full-time. And, you know, it looks like the Department of Agriculture are going to be involved with uh, any kind of wildlife surveillance also. So we got to run two programs at the same time we just don't have enough uh, folks to do it. Uh, we want to put up a portable office uh, for the two livestock inspectors and the veterinary medical officer. And we want to put up a quarantine facility for handling and testing livestock, um, from, particularly from the small farms and ranches that do not have their own corrals and facilities. So someplace to, to haul animals to, to, to test. Um, the fund, the request also is to uh, funds to purchase feed for producers when conducting herd tests. And this is something that um, we've run across over the years. It's, it's difficult um, when we ask these guys to test their herds, they got to bring them in. The test requires, uh, just like when you take a TB test, you get the test and then you got to go back in and read it. Well, um, it's difficult for them to let the cattle go and you got to go catch them again. So they try to hold them close to the corral. And um, there's not enough feed close to the crowd and it's expensive for them to buy feed. So we're asking for funds to, to um, purchase feed for, for testing. And um, 
Yeah, the vehicle we're using is, is pretty ancient and running on borrowed time. So we're asking for funds for, for another vehicle, basically to move the inspectors around and move equipment. Um, we, we're sending an additional portable chute from the Big Island and we have a livestock trailer on the Big Island that we'll ship over here to move animals uh, to and from uh, facility when we do have the facility. Uh, Senator Decoit is uh, trying to get uh, most of his funding uh, approved for us at this legislative session, so hopefully she's successful. Go ahead. Points to remember and consider the quarantine orders put in place to prevent further spread. Um, it, 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 it provides us stigma when we quarantine so we don't take it lightly, uh, but we're concerned enough that this outbreak is big enough that um, if, if we're not careful, we could end up uh, jeopardizing the status of the whole state and, and potentially even affect um, other states because we do move cattle. Uh, from this state, including Molokai, to other states. Uh, this outbreak appears to be um, highly contagious, uh, substantial, and widespread, and may have multiple sources. Uh, bovine TB is infectious to humans and other animals. Uh, historically, wild, wildlife, uh, mongoose, feral pigs, and axis deer have been found infected with BTB or bovine tuberculosis on Molokai, and their role in this outbreak is yet to be determined. Testing of cattle and other livestock plan to, is a plan to expand to the entire island of Molokai on trace and contact herd testing uh, to be com completed first. So we, we're finishing up the contact and trace testing, and then we'll finish up with testing the others that are in between to eventually test the whole island. Meat from cattle, swine, deer that pass USDA Food Safety Inspection Service Inspection that slaughter are wholesome and pass for human consumption. Um, you can see that when we tested a couple of those West End herds, a uh, very small percentage of the herd was, was infected. The rest of the animals are still considered exposed. We don't wanna leave them in the herd to go to slaughter. And the slaughter process is actually developed to look for bovine tuberculosis lesions. When it was developed in 1917, that was its purpose. And until today, they go through all those lymph nodes, the same lymph nodes that Gene or Emerson or George Mayo was going through when we did the wildlife work. Um, those inspectors will go through those same lymph nodes and look for lesions. So when they get pat, when they finish with those carcasses, those carcasses are wholesome and they're safe for human consumption. No infected axis deer have been found over the past 15 years of inspection of 7,000 deer at the Mokai slaughter plant. That's something else to remember. No infected axis deer were found in the 1998 through 2012 wildlife surveillance program on Molokai. And uh, 20 infected feral pigs were detected, all between Kamalo and Mapaleo, in the 1998 and 2012 Wildlife Surveillance Program on Molokai. The 2012 is not a magic number where the infection just died out. We just, we weren't funded to continue doing the surveillance, and we don't know what the status was after that because surveillance stopped. Okay, next. Summary quarantine order number 158 um, involves the entire island of Molokai and is in place currently. The current outbreak, the most significant bovine tuberculosis outbreak on Molokai since the late 1970s. The infection found in this outbreak is related to bovine tuberculosis on bacteria previously found in feral swine on the east end of Molokai. Historically, bovine tuberculosis found in feral swine and mongoose along infected beef cattle operations on the east end of Molokai. And historically, bovine tuberculosis was found in excess deer in very low numbers in various locations on the east end of Molokai. Next. What's next? Um, 
while we're doing the work here, we're also working with, uh, right now we're working with the Texas Animal Health Commission to move non-exposed, non-exposed mean, meaning um, basically moving wean offs, uh, four to 600 pound calves um, to another state to finish that cattle, which is typically what happens is some of the cattle from this island, all the islands, um, we move a bunch of cattle to the mainland to finish. So we're working with the Texas Animal Health Commission. They have several quarantine feedlots in the Panhandle area and slaughter plants for feeding and marketing of um, these non-exposed um, calves. Uh, so we have agreement from the Texas Animal Health Commission. They do it for their own state. They do it for neighboring states. We have uh, TB investigations going on or TB infected herds and they'll move cattle from those herds to these quarantine feedlots to feed out and then go to slaughter. Uh, TB testing will be required uh, within 60 days prior to shipment of those cattle. And our Hawaii Department of Agriculture veterinarians will be the ones completing that TB testing and issuing the certificates of veterinary inspection for those shipments. Um, Hawaii Department of Agriculture and USDA veterinary services We'll work with hunters to obtain wildlife samples for sampling um, to send to the National Veterinary Service Laboratory for testing. And, uh, and again, Senator Decoit is working with, uh, with the legislature to obtain funding to support testing and control of bovine tuberculosis on Molokai. The Hawaii Department of Agriculture, USDA Veterinary Services will contact uh, USDA Farm Service Agency to inquire about fencing to separate uh, livestock from wildlife. We've reached the question and answers. So I guess um, we can take questions from folks that are here in the building and then um, Stephen will, our IT, um, uh, specialists will help me with the questions that come over the, um, the Zoom, the Zoom meeting. So, we, any questions right here? I would hope that uh, all your comments, and summary, and all your comments and everything you're showing, you can put that in the printed material and get it for us, so we don't have to give all these things to us. Yeah, I apologize. I don't ask so, some questions to be repeated, especially if you got a mask on. I, I'm a, almost deaf. I got to read lips. Let me say that I wanted some printed material from your PowerPoint. No, I need just information. We have something to take home and look at. Okay. I don't know how you possibly think you can remember all of this. Yeah, so. Um, I think everybody, when you sign your name, we're getting your email. It's it's kind of a big PowerPoint, but it went. I sent it to our IT folks and. We just got a million bucks a week. Oh, what is it? Can we keep that? Just got a month. We'll figure out how to do it. We have something that we can look at. We don't have to keep remembering it. I mean, just. Yeah, you. Well, we've heard this three times now. So all I'm saying is that. We had something we could look at, and then we could mull over, and then we have some great questions in common. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, we, if you'd rather have it in print, yeah. we'll, we'll go ahead and print it up, and then maybe Jean can get it to you. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. I'm confused. I, I thought you said that no access here has been found positive, and yet that last slide you said. Historically, access here have been known to be carriers of the to be the 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 Always found infected right around the infected herd. The feral pigs, um, not too far from the infected herd, like a couple miles. Access deal was just kind of sporadic. 
Um, it was, yeah. Uh, so why is Mapolero doing the magical police? Like, why are we there? Why are we in the United States? It seems like the testing for TCR in 1870 was over in Mapolero and they detected that. And we took, this is 2020. What's, what's there that's causing it to have outbreaks? Why, why are we having outbreaks now? No, from that area, specifically in that area. Why was that area? It okay. came from a pig, right? On Big Island, you got millions of pigs. Yeah. And you know, test your TP over there. What I'm trying to say is, why is the Mapulemu so specific in that area where it's from? Yeah, why it persists. Um, and, you know, I, I got other state and federal veterinarians on the call. If any of them want to assist with the questions, you can just, I mean, they're people with more expertise than me. They can pop up on the screen and answer, but um, different plate. I, I had a um, general slide about bovine tuberculosis, where it showed um, that we have different places in the world where um, New Zealand, for example, um, I think the bush, bushtail possum is considered to be the reservoir. In Michigan. And, and somewhat in Minnesota also, it looks like white-tailed deer is a reservoir and they get persistent infection that spills over from, from white-tailed deer back to cattle operations, yeah. And in England, I think it's the badger. So different places you have these reservoirs. Um, the work we were doing between 98 and 2012, I knew New Zealand we visited with some researchers in New Zealand quite a bit because they were really interested because the problem seemed to persist in feral pigs. And um, they weren't convinced that feral pigs are a reservoir. They felt that feral pigs were just, they, they're in the environment and they, you know, they may be scavenging on something else that, that's sick, yeah. And um, so I guess without beating around the bush too much, Axis deer would be the one that you know you would be concerned with. Um, but, but you cannot find them in that. Yeah. I, you know, other guys can jump in on that too, but it's it's um, interesting. Like um, because of that criticism, at, particularly after I did uh, um, the news, um, that piece with the, the news uh, the other week. Uh, I ended up doing some literature search and it's interesting. I give you an example, uh, Michigan uh, with their white, white tailed deer and their surveillance there. I believe they had like something like 170 something thousand deer looked at and it came up with 700 something positive out of 170 something thousand. So that shows that the prevalence or the, you know, the amount infected in that population is really low. It was uh, something like 0.3%, less than a half a percent. And then when you look at work that was done in Minnesota, it looked like it, it was uh, similar. I don't know if anybody else on the call um, from veterinary services want to comment on that? Actually, Jason, this is Larry Rawson. I don't think I could add any more to what what you're saying, I really didn't hear the question either very well. Okay, sorry. Um, so the, the question is, is um, you know, why are we looking at excess deer, I guess, because the prevalence here, you know, we haven't found very many infected excess deer on Mokai historically yet. And my only explanation right now is from what I'm finding in the literature in that the prevalence in deer in general, other deer um, like white tail, for example, appears to be very low in a population. So I don't, I don't know who all was on the call from veterinary services. I know for some of the some of the guys that are experts in this area are way back east, and this is like midnight for them. So, anyway.
Okay, so I guess they didn't have any more comments. Um, we got to look, yeah? So yeah. what you're trying to say is that we never test enough beer in order to determine whether beer are an infected person. That's what you're trying to say. Yeah, I think um, looking back at the work we did between 98 and 2012, that would be my conclusion and that would be my criticism. And, and there was a reason why we did that is because we had so much dollars and, and the access deer was just coming in really easily and the feral pigs was real slow. And I wanted to get more feral pigs looked at. And so we just kind of slowed down on the access deer and it was probably, probably a mistake, but- um, You just said it's probably a mistake. We should have tested more. Yeah, okay, so you're basing that off of data that is very, very limited. That's what you're saying, right? Well, I mean, I don't think it's limited. If, if we got data that goes back to 1960. Um, and right, right now, we, we, I work with the Department of Agriculture. My focus right now is on the livestock operations and trying to stamp it out in the, in the livestock operations and not have it spread further. Um, we expect that we have a wildlife reservoir. Um, if you go back to 1985, they took out all the cattle, basically left the island free of cattle for two years. And it still was here 10 years later in 1997. So, and then when we looked after 1997, we find it in a wildlife species which happened to be the feral pigs. Are the feral pigs, um, if, if you go to Spain and Portugal, they're gonna believe that um, feral, their thoughts that feral pigs are, are a reservoir by themselves, they can be a reservoir. Um, but you go other places and, and the deer tend to be the reservoir. Um, so unless we look, we're not gonna know um, I tell you um, something that's very, very recent. I got a call last night. Gene got a sample this morning. We worked on the sample this afternoon. And because I'm technically challenged, I couldn't get pictures up. But we have a deer that was um, shot yesterday in Mauna Loa that grossly has classic lesions for bovine tuberculosis. Yeah. Huh? yeah. And it was uh, pretty extensive, but it gets shipped off to the national lab. So I'll just leave it at that at this point. We're not going to know until, I mean, we can't make a diagnosis just visually, but um, it has to get sent off to the national lab before we do. In the last month, 30, uh, 42 deer, 42 deer in all of them, no lesions. No yeah. And I think they've and been, yeah, and I think they've been thousands that have been right. done over the last 10, 15 years. All run through FSIS, none of them over them. here. Yeah, so that, I mean, as far as marketing of, of the venison, um, I'm going to have to get more expert comment, but from what I'm seeing in the literature, that's probably very doable that you're going to continue to find negative animals, even if the animal might be serving as a reservoir, that numbers may be very low because that's what we find in, in the literature. That's what we find in elsewhere. So what I want to clarify, just I understand your point of view that your main concern is what you find in the cattle, and that's also, I I, my concern as well, I, you know, I want that to be addressed, you know, correctly. Um, what my concern is that your comment on the, on the news only specifically targeted access here, when your literature here showed that pigs and mongoose were also part of that, that, you know, reservoir thing. So I don't know why that comment was made in regards to just here, when it does, you, you could possibly, like your literature said, if the mongoose or uh, feral pig. Yeah. Um, I discussed um, deer because they are known reservoir. 
I discussed deer in general, but the comment that was made that associated the deer with the um, infection in the cattle was made by the reporter, not me. And I've been doing interviews for years and I'm hoping that is my last one because it always ends up that way. Well, they'll end up saying what they want to say. Basically, was said in error. Like it wasn't. It wasn't said in a way. Yeah, I I feel like it was. I feel like it was taken out of context. But um, I mean, that happens. Um, and I know I've you know I've gotten a couple emails and had a discussion with um, over that. And you know. And I'm willing to address it the best we can to give confidence um, to the market. Look, as we're going through this, I mean, I'm trying to maintain conf confidence in the beef cattle market. There's no reason why we wouldn't do the same for excess deer. Yeah. And I think it's tougher with the beef cattle um, coming out of these infected herds to give confidence to the consumer. But once they go through that slaughter plant, once they reach, receive the FSIS inspection, I'm confident that that's a wholesome product. And I've got some other reasons for feeling that way and that that work we did between 97 and 2012, we had three different inspectors. We had George Mayo, we had Emerson, um, call, and we had Gene, and they were just, receive basic training to find these lesions. And I mean, uh, there was probably close to 2000 samples or 1500 samples totally that went to the National Veterinary Service Lab. Whether we saw lesions or not, the tissues were sent to the lab and they ran all those tests. And these guys did not miss one infection. And so the same thing goes for the FSIS in inspectors when they're done in doing their work, I'm confident that that's a wholesome product. And on top of that, it is a product that is um, killed by cooking. Yeah, so mm -hmm. anyway, yeah. So how, how guaranteed is it, is it TB test on the cow? 80%? Yep, just, a, yeah, 80 to 90% right in that, that category, right, right in there. So that's why we end up doing the two tests. And that's why we haven't waited for them to fall into the reactor zone. We took them if they're in the suspect zone and put them down and look for lesions. And we, we took them, even if they were on the line, we took them and put them down. So we, we're looking at it really hard. You know, these herds that we test, um, we basically any little bump we feel, they call in and we respond. We can give you a false negative. But what? We can give you a false negative. Okay. Yeah. 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 You can. Yeah. And then, and that's why it's. To my understanding, when you molokai gets tested, the whole state gets tested. Molokai. Because you're gonna trace down his pig. How far you go? You go to where he got his pig from? Where his kids went? We're tracing wherever. They told us they, they sold pigs too. But you know, he got from Maui. Huh? Maybe he got his pigs from Maui or, you know, people get for his pigs or steer, um, steer stuff from off island. Yeah, you know, we know this stuff. We do both. We do trace in and trace out. So we are all tracing the way they got their animals from. Yeah. His animals were local? <coughs> yeah. It came from off island. Yeah. Dominant. Um, Okay, all right. quick question. Come up on this animal. They went to Mapuleo, stayed there in Mapuleo. So, did they contract TB from that before you brought it here? Do you know that? Still up in the air. Still up in the air. You don't know. No, uh, not definitely. So these animals came here, could have brought the disease from there. Try again. This animal that were there, they could have brought the disease from east to where he brought it back to central. That is that in my mind, that's the most likely, that's the most uh, 
likely scenario. However, some of that genomic work is telling us something different. And so I need to have that, we need to, we need to see, we need to see the wildlife in Mapalejo and Hole who are around that herd to see how they match up, the genomes match up. We're looking at the bacteria. Yeah, that, one more question. Yeah. Is there a test for the swine to test it by? We have a skin test we can do in a swine. We did one herd. Um, that's the best we have right now. Um, but the confidence that we have in that test for swine is even lower than cattle. And we're trying to work, uh, the National Veterinary Services Laboratory uh, wants to um, help validate our blood tests. And so we're gonna work with these um, Donnelly trace out herds and collect some blood samples from them to see if we end up with some positive, some infected animals there to see how that blood test will work. The blood test would, would be very helpful because basically it's a one-time deal. Plus it's probably, hopefully it's a better test than the, than the skin test that we do on the pigs. We're also trying to do, um, see if we can use a blood test for cattle. That way we don't have to handle them twice. They don't have to you know, stay at 72 hours, come back again, read. Problem is, is the test that they use requires that we give, get live white blood cells samples to the national lab within something like 24 hours. And we cannot get samples there fast enough. If we're close, we could, but we cannot. So they're trying to um, work on that test so that we can do part of the test in Hawaii and then send, send it once it's stable, send it to, to them to do so. Uh, we've taken samples from some of these infected herds for them to test that, that out. And so hopefully we have a, a different, a, a better tool to use down the road. So a more accurate tool too. So not an easy disease. I mean, I put up that slide and made a comment about, you know, being found in bison in, in, in um, Wyoming 17,000 years ago. This disease has been around for a long time and tough to deal with. You know, I don't know if people realize uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, uh, the meat inspection program and pasteurization was put in place to um, control mycobacterium bovis infections in humans and has done a really good job. Today, 2% of the human infections are mycobacterium bovis. Uh, we do have situations where people actually have given mycobacterium bovis back to cattle. Um, some of our dairies along the border with Mexico and stuff. Mexico has <laughs> endemic problems. Some of the people get infected. They come work in the dairies, they infected the cattle. Um, but to, today, 25% of the world's population is infected with mycobacterium, that's tuberculosis, 2% of that is bovis. So it is a persistent infection up until COVID. It was the number one um, cause of deaths in humans from an infectious agent. Well, COVID's taken that over, but uh, so it's, it, it's a problem, it's persistent, it's tough to get rid of, um, you know, where we have infection, where we have a reservoir in wildlife, it's, it's been really tough. And I think that was the difference between the rest of the state and, and Molokai in that we didn't have a reservoir. I mean, when Maui was infected, never have access there. So it was able to solve him. Yeah. All those islands had feral pigs, but we never had deer. And I, you know, I don't want to keep picking on deer for folks who are, marketing, but I try to be realistic. Um, you know, it, from what I can see, it's, it's at a very low prevalence and you ought to be able to have a marketable product. If it's gone through FSIS inspection, your customer should be very um, confident that you got a, you got a wholesome product, yes. Yeah, so, and we can help you the best we can make that point, yeah, so, yeah. Earlier, I would ask about the Mapule. The reason why I ask you that is because the, the farms that you mentioned uh, in Michigan and New Zealand, they're all from dairies. And 
uh, you know, we know that Mapula had a dairy in that area, and so a lot of the, the transmission was to feed. Uh, the reason why I know that is because um, my father-in-law is a, a dairy farmer from Wisconsin, so I had a long conversation with him about it. So that's why I asked about why is it special about Mapula. Well, um, you know, he told me that a lot of times they don't really still do silage. And so when they did silage, it cut back on the transmission of feed from animal to animal from the feed. So when the drought is here, we all buy feed from, from wherever we get them from. And we don't know if that feed is not linked with the, the TV. But according to your, your, your uh, facts, that it's genetically related to that pig in the Mongolian area. So what I'm trying to state, uh, why I ask about the Mahbolele is that seed or the cattle that was brought into Mahbolele a long time ago at the dairy will transmit it to the pigs and then we then it spread out to there. Yeah. So the reason why I said, made that point is because the ones that you mentioned, Michigan and it was in Indiana and it was on, and in Kansas, um, all from dairy farms transmitted from seed. So that's why I asked the question, how come Mahbolele? When I already knew that we all know that Mapule had the dairy over there, so um, that's why I asked if you guys did the research about how come that area was specified. And of all the pigs in Hawaii, and all the cattle in Hawaii, how come that one particular area was is the one that has this issue when nobody else in, you know, from Kabul Dairy in Big Island never have that kind of history where they can go back so much here. Yeah, well, we've, we've had other dairies in the state that historically, you know, were infected, but they got cleaned up, yeah. Um, why, I mean, you have a point, though, why certain geographic areas seem to be hot spots? You know, why, why is it maintained in those areas? And unfortunately, that's out of my area of expertise. You got to get people that, you know, um, willing to go, first of all, you know, what species is, is maintaining the infection in that area? Is it a pig? Is it a deer? Is it something else we missed? You know? Or is it a feed? I mean, I don't, I'm not sure how it would be maintaining feed itself. And if it was feed that was imported, um, would be, a, you know, the genome would say, hey, this is related to wherever you bought the feed from, you know, some other area, like, and not, not, not from, Molokai, yeah, but everything is related back to Molokai ancestor. Yeah. Okay. So, I have a question. I mean, the bottom line is the future of cattle ranching on Molokai is to have some kind of You know, we have, yeah, we have, we have actually, I don't know how long ago, what, 10 years maybe, more. We actually sent feral swine to Colorado and they ended up in Iowa for that purpose to work on development of an oral vaccine. And they continue to do that kind of work, which is great, but I tend to be impatient. And, um, you know, I, mean, I think Kip, you know, People say, you know, he's critical, but I, I like the criticism. I mean, I like the comments. They, I mean, to me, they justified comments. I mean, we keep going around in a circle. How many times are we going to do the same thing over and over again? You're not solving the problem. And so sometimes I just kind of stop and um, I just kind of try to think outside the box a little bit. And I give you an example. Um, we work on couple other um, infectious diseases that tend to um, uh, a problem with swine. Uh, one is uh, brucellosis in swine. Another one is called pseudorabies. And whether you count your blessings or not, you don't have that on Molokai, but Kauai. Not yet. You don't have it? Not yet, huh? You don't. We have it on Kauai, you have it on Oahu, you have it on Maui, you have it on Big Island. And what happens is we get these spillover infections into our domestic pig operations. Then we got to go depopulate those pig operations because there's no treatment for those diseases. And when we depopulate uh, 
an operation like that, we come up with a herd plan and they go, we follow the herd plan to get the quarantine rescinded and come back into production. And one of the things that we put in that herd plan is that they either have to put up a double fence around their pig or some sort of solid barrier to stop feral pigs and domestic pigs from commingling. So most of those infections always end up being either the domestic pig got out and commingled with a feral pig outside or a feral pig got in or got put in and infected the herd that way. And all of these herds that we've depopulated and have the requirement put in place have never gotten reinfected, even though the threat is still there right outside right outside the fence. So I start thinking, well, I mean, the only thing you can do is put up a fence. I mean, that's a, that's a big fence and that's an expensive fence. Um, but I mean, that's the comment I made about, um, you know, USD um, veterinary services and the state uh, trying to visit with um, USDA food safe, uh, farm service agency. And an example would be, um, the big island, when Haleamoma was putting out a lot of um, fog, it was wiping out of fences. Fences you build that um, you expect to last for 10 to 15 years, three years was gone. And people didn't know how they were going to ranch anymore. And it became a big enough problem. And I don't know exactly who got it done, but all of a sudden, Farm Service Agency has a program to um, replace perimeter fences. Now we were, everybody I think in the state works with USDA and RCS on internal fences to help control soil erosion and things like that. But now here came this program to put up perimeter fences because they felt that that, that was an emergency. So I don't, you know, I'm over here testing cattle herds for TB, which is a big problem and big enough problem on its own. But I'm looking at you guys' operations and thinking, you got a bigger problem. You got no grass. I mean, there's, there's nothing left for the cattle to eat. So, you know, if you had a program like that, you know, a possibility of killing two birds with one stone. Yeah? So, but I don't, I, I, I'm just looking for something practical. Yeah. I uh, come like five feet. I wouldn't be a good night if I just sat here and thought that the cattle that were moved to Mongolia, you know, were then infected by a, a Mongolia feral swine and then moved back to Lillibor in a six month period of time. I just don't see TV going like that. And I, and I think, you know, I acknowledge, I don't know, I'm not an expert, but that just seems so highly unlikely to me. Now, I'm a little frustrated over the fact that we're having this meeting now, and it affects so much of this community, either the deer or the animals. You know, you, you say that you, you went and you sanitized, you know, Mr. Avon's place. Okay, I don't know why you couldn't have a sanitized place up where the MP and them have a corral. And if you had to bring an animal, you bring an animal in there, you test them all, it's a sanitized area. They don't leave there. They stay there until they're either shipped out and sent to the van, they're free, you know, in a sanitized area. Because if you stop cow cap on this island, you're gonna kill the ranch in the And by quarantine, you're killing the ranch in the It's just, it's as easy as that. And I don't know why we have to spend all this money on more guys going into the bushes to look for a pig, because even if you find them, it's not gonna tell you any more than we already know for the last 70 years. So to me, what you gotta do is sit outside the box. And I'm sorry that we weren't all invited to a meeting where we could all share our poop poop and come up with a plan. As opposed to just drop the hammer, quarantine, and we learn it from a blog. We don't get it from a certified letter that you just sent us. It came out in a blog. And then we called Gene Ross at all. Sorry, that was a release to her. You know, this is the you know, this is 2022. You know, you could very easily have a big feedlot of my, of my MP guy's place that's sanitized. People can bring the animals there, they get them tested. They can buy the grain and the feed, they can feed them right there. Once they get them and they're all done, they can load them on the container and they're out of here. But if you don't do that, ranching on Molokai is dead. Yeah. And I have a real, you know, I'm, I'm 
put the butter right here because you know, if we get feed from off the island, you know who's dissing on that feed? It would be a mammoth. And maybe they bring it in that way. I don't know how long the work it was this last, but you don't know. Six months. So, so, six months. Six months. Six months. Six months. So what I'm trying to say is that we, we together can collectively come up with a solution to help you solve this problem. But killing our cattle industry on this island is not it. So it's not our intent to kill the cattle industry. Um, and I'm willing to sit down with you guys and I mean, people like me telling you, you're swine in your ranch up there, and you gotta go test because you haven't tested all the swine in or find out if they got TV on the Yeah. So okay. Kip, I'm willing to sit down and talk talk to you guys. You guys come up with ideas. Like I said, I'm looking for solutions outside the box, yeah, at this point. So and um, I'm not sure that as those um, potential solutions get passed up the, the ladder, whether they get accepted or not, but because they need to think outside the box to try to solve this if we're going to keep cattle raised, Jack. Jack. I mean, we can help you solve the problem. We don't want to be the problem. Yeah, no. We sit down, I'll, I'll make time to sit down with you guys and see. You I'll make time to sit down with you guys and listen to what you have to say. And um, you might have to repeat it a few times for me to sink in, but um, then maybe the light goes off. Yeah. What is the uh, TV testing consist of? Is that something like local hunters can help you guys with? Is it, is it something that is kind of easy to do? Or is it like you got to send stuff out on my end or something? I think one of the reasons thing is, you know, people, we're talking about our food, they come to the access here. The livelihood of families when come to the cattle. And so we like know that we know the numbers. Like I know I do. And so I, I slay access on a daily basis. So it's, you know, hard for me to kind of think that the access can, I know we had some access at regions and stuff. But also there's other things that can cause that stuff, not just TV. Mm -hmm. And so to know that we know, I think it would sit better with the community. So we get guys going out and slaughtering here on a daily basis. And if it could be some kind of help for you guys to, you know, help you guys collect data on these animals out there. Um, maybe not just the deer and the swine, kind of TV going other stuff like rats. Mongoose, that kind of stuff, because the, the new set can go to, you know, your, your pets, yourself. So, um, are we testing all animals, or we just go pick two out of the bunch and kind of, you know, blame those ones? Um, so, I guess that's my main concern, is how we can help you, because I'm out there all the time. You know, all my best friends are doing the same thing, and if you put tests in our hands, teach us how to collect the data. You just all protest the animals. I think we can give you guys way better numbers than you guys ever had before. Yeah, we intend to get the hunters um, engaged. So it was, again, sit down with you guys, come up with a plan that works. 97 through, um, or oh, 98 through 2012, I mean, basically everything was brought in to the inspectors. They don't want to the necropsies and sent everything went off to the national lab. I think the national lab is willing to work with the samples, whatever samples at this point that we give them. Is that correct, Larry? Dr. Rossin? Yeah, if I can find the mute button, yes, sir, that is correct. Any sample we can get, we can submit in culture, yeah. So um, that, could be a lot, that could be a lot of samples, but uh, if if Michigan did 175,000 samples, I think we could we could wreck, um, increase our numbers a little bit. Yeah. Anybody? Okay. Yeah, so like what we keep saying, you know, we, we produce cattle. To me, I mean, before we open the door with with deer and you know, we know cattle is a problem right now. My biggest thing is on the economic side. I know we talked about how, you know, you try, I mean, we really appreciate the help, but we're in the business of top calf. We cannot diversify our 
perfectly grass fed beef. I mean, we know, we, you know, Jack, you know, you've been at the slaughterhouse enough, we know what well, I can uh, produce grass fed beef, but we know grass. <laughs> so, what I'm saying is, for us ranchers now, we know we are a negative herd. We kind of, you know, I understand the point, we kind of shift out of anywhere. Our markets that we have are not come by. So, yeah. I know we've talked about solutions. For me, the best solution would be your education. Yeah. If, you, if you wanted to get a hold of this situation with Gallup, for me, that's my perspective. You already have yeah. Yeah, so no for our market. My buyer told me straight up with the quarantine being held in Molokai, nobody gonna buy them. at what I like the market at. They won't buy them at a discounted price. To me, that's not that's the thing right? That's hard for us consumers. We are already running out of negative. Most of the renters here, we all know that. So having this added kind of puts a burden on us. Or 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 some type of program not to lose because if we do it the way that we're running right now, two three years from now we done. We, we won't have the financials to keep going. Yeah, we still going to continue to have this problem. Fixing not going to be a solution because we all know fixing costs money. All time, no more money. Grants only last so long. And just another point, you know, Jack at Cal and Mahole for how many years, Jack? Eight? Six? Five? Five? Not one. He never had one. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what happened uh, because Donnelly said pigs going to slaughter for all that time and all of a sudden, boom. You know, so something, so know something happens. Got the bigger ranchers that are in mid season with their cows. The only sure. option they have is to send them a feedlot that's going to retain ownership time. I don't know if you've ever done retain ownership, but you pay for everything. They're, not, they're going to end up losing money at the end of the day. So I agree with Jeff and MP that what we need is a different approach to it because the quarantine is going to kill the cows in this real more time. It's inevitable. And the other problem I see is that is, it, is any state agency actually looking at the whole picture about? Where the state of the landscape is on Molokai? Where the what? Where the state of the landscape is, where the, what the land condition is like. Nobody can grow grass anymore unless you do fence and irrigate. Like you got a deer population that's out of control, and you got a drop. Yeah. So is any state agency actually looking at those problems and trying to deal with it? Because I think you would agree that if you have a stressed animal, their immune system is not going to work very well. It doesn't work very well, they're going to be more susceptible to the to the TB bacteria, right? So they're, they're more likely, plus, like in the deer population, deer are eating all kinds of things they never ate before because they've already mowed down everything else instead of okay. on, on the east end, they're eating things I've never seen them eat before, including land data, which has a lot of toxicity to the plant. So they're getting compounds in those animals that can't be good for them because they're all toxic. So I guess one question I have is, is anybody looking at the big picture? Just want to think out of the box. I think that's where we got to go, is how, how do we solve this problem? Because if you say that the TB is embedded in the wildlife, how are you, not, how are you going to prevent those to those contact? I have deer fencing around my place, the deer still jump in. So I'd have, to, I'd, have to, I'd have to be very vigilant about shooting the deer every time they come in. So. There's a number of problems with this, but the quarantine will definitely kill the cattle in the Estrella because the ranchers don't have any options at this point. 
even depopulating is a problem, right? Because if, if Sakagawa's got what, 150 head, how fast can Molokai digest 150 head and slaughter them? Not fast enough. And if they go to Oahu, like you said, you got all that expensive sanitizing, cleaning the pens, cleaning the containers, all that stuff. Plus, you still have to end up testing over there, correct? When you ship the cattle to depopulate, do those cattle have to get tested on that site? No. no? They go to slaughter the day they get to this. Okay. So there's another question about testing because Calipana's herd, when it was slaughtered, didn't it end up like 18 or 90 percent more positive? Try again. When Calipana's herd was slaughtered, right, when they depopulated his, mm. didn't it end up as 18 or 90 percent false positives from the cattle that already tested negative? Mm -hmm. Right? They're they're taking them them out. Out. I'm positive yeah. on both tests. But in one in one group there were seven cattle that had TB yeah. that were all yeah. tested negative. So is there a way that the state can set up a lab somewhere in a closer region than the national lab to be able to at least help process the blood test sample? Because yeah. the blood test sample would actually help the ranchers because if you just gotta put it in the pen one time, that's a lot different than trying to put them in the pen twice. To read the comparative study or the other study, and it would help with the feed situation. Yeah, so that's being looked at, and um, okay. I think, um, yeah, you guys should we should consider putting together a group to look at all aspects. But I'm not going to be the guy to look at all aspects. But we can play our role. Um, the quarantine order, you know, is something that we looked at long before we put in place. I tell you that whether we had a quarantine order in place or not, they weren't going to take Molokai cattle. Another state wasn't going to take Molokai cattle and put it any place but a quarantine feedlot. So that was that was already a done deal. They watch what's happening. When I tell them how far our non-exposed cattle test negative are from where our infection was, to them that's a neighboring that's a, that's a contact herd. It's so close for them. Yeah. Isn't that the reason we tested cattle on the East for 25 years to so maintain the, the, the TB free status for the state? Yeah. For the entire state, not just Molokai, but for the entire state. Right. Right. So for 25 years, we've been doing the same thing. So the rest of the state can ship the non-TB feed yards, right? Yep. And including the rest of the Molokai at that point too. Right. So all of Molokai actually. <coughs> So, Dr. Monique, don't you think, with all due respect, you got a hard job. I don't, I don't envy you at all. But, like Jack says, and like MP's doing, you know, I mean, that's a family business. And, and, and the state's going to kill them. They're going to effectively kill them. So, don't you think we could set up, instead of hiring two guys and trucks and a house and Lord knows what else, which is a waste of money to go out and look at, try to find a feral pig that got TV because maybe he does or maybe he doesn't. Because that's an awful lot of waste of money. I mean, if we could put together some block pasture where it can be sanitized, I can bring my cattle in, we can put them in there, we can test them. If there's a, if there's a bad animal in them, you call them right then and there, and you're gone. You know, and you test them, you keep them there, we get feed coming in with a silo, with a sanitized area. They already got the loading docks. And so once you get them so that they're, they're bovine free, then you put them in the chute, you get them in a the container, and you send them where they got to go, and you get market price. You know, but if we keep, yeah. keep populating and, and keep... As long as we can convince... Just to pass the yeah. over and over and over, as long as you can convince another state and they have confidence that that's a free animal, then yeah, they would allow them to, to feed elsewhere in a state besides the quarantine feedlot. Um, it's the same and, can by kicking down the road. Isn't that why the test is determined before? Isn't the test to determine whether or not they have the, the whole fight the world? And that's good enough because it's good enough to sell it in the market, it should be good enough to sell it out of state. Well, it's up to that state yeah, how they want to run their program. So, I mean, basically, what Texas and I appreciate them 
what they're saying is we got these quarantine feed lots of quarantine pens and you can bring your cattle in if you test them within 60 days of going and we're saying we'll do the test for you and um and and feed them out uh, the question is is whether someone will take the risk and buy the cattle and do it versus you're going to take the risk but because we're labeled we're What's that? Try again? You know what I mean? We like we say, hey, I'm off the way. I know the tuberculosis in the And where are you guys going to be? You know what I mean? We're all in the same boat. So, and I won't say it again, but my point is, we got to think outside the box here because what happened before can't happen again because it didn't work before. So why do it again? Yeah, you, know, you guys put together a group and yeah. you tell me, I mean, because you gotta have more than me. <laughs> you tell me who else you want and I'll try to get those folks to a meeting with you guys to try and solve it the way you think it, it's solvable. You know, when you're talking about a sanitized feed, feed yard or whatever, what I'm talking about with putting up fence that separates wildlife from from your herd would accomplish the same thing, you know. And hopefully, all those herds would be recognized as being free. We are. We we know we have the tools to take infection out of a out of a herd or out of an area, even if you got to start all over again. Um, but if we put up a barrier where that infection can come back in, then we ought to be able to clear clear that herd for regular commerce, yeah. Okay. We'll put together a group and bring your ideas and we'll work on it. Can you email me something that says, this is something you can buy? Oh, oh, I could buy fencing, fencing will do this, or we could get feed from some place that will do this. I mean, it's it's a little daunting to to try to talk to people that are you know on the screen, get a letter from you know head veterinarian Maeda, or get something from the HDOA with a nice signed letter, and they're not here to talk to us. You know. I mean, it's, I know the rest of it on your shoulders, but if that's the case, what I would like to have is nothing that says we don't have to do this quarantine if these things occur. And now, if we have a desanitized place that we can put the animal back, we can get the feed that'll do it. We don't have to hire anybody to go check animals. We can have a, have a sanitized pen up in the they should be labor to localize and get a sanitized trip. Yeah. I'll sit down and you can explain how that's going to work. Excuse me? I'll sit down with you guys, you explain how it's going to work. So if we put together a group, you can sit down with yeah. whoever you want at the meeting, because I'm not, I'm sure I'm not going to be the only one. Yeah. I'm I, I think it's also important that you clarify all of this is a meeting. Because you're putting out there in the public a lot of information that concerns the industry, not just us, but the cattle. And it's illegal to read. So, but like you said, the market not, they don't have nothing to do with it all, right? Yeah. So, you got to somehow fix this way. <clears throat> and let the general public know this information that we discuss. Going to the TV show. Steven, we got any. Questions um, on Zoom? Yes, we do have um, one from the public. I'm going to call them forward. And also, I'd like to let all the others know that they can raise their hand and I'll get to them in order. Um, there's the raise hand button. So, first, I'm going to call up Susan Donnelly. Susan, you. perfect. Hi, I'm Kiku Donnelly, and um, can you hear me? 
I'm asking the people here if they can hear. Yeah, you can hear. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I want to open the floor to um, anyone who had questions about Donnelly Farms because I disagree with a lot of stuff um, that that I that I heard tonight. So there was some questions about us bringing pigs from Maui. It was always from Molokai. And I just want to um, kind of address those questions. Okay, so, so go right ahead. I think everybody can hear that. Yeah, everybody's nodding, they can hear that. Okay, and, so go right ahead. No, I, you did. You went right ahead and you said, your pigs are always from Molokai, not from Maui, so. Yeah, we were just asking. No, and, and another thing, um, I think Kip Dunbar had questions too, right? About pigs, I don't know. You had pig questions? I don't know. I, I mean, I was listening to the whole thing, so I, I just want to address whatever. Um, whatever you need to, you heard that didn't um, come out right, just go ahead and say it. Everybody can hear, so. Okay, well, first of all, I, I want to acknowledge that our cattle, they were never tested. That's right. Um, my pigs, they became positive because I ran it through the slaughterhouse and it, because I sold my pigs and I market my pigs. So it was a good thing that we actually found that it was TB positive because we were aware of the si situation. My cattle was never tested. My sheep was never tested. And when it came down to it, um, USDA at the slaughterhouse, they found that one heifer was positive and that was a calf. So I am, I'm kind of like mind boggled with this whole thing too. And I never import feed from anywhere because I heard someone say that maybe I imported feed, but no, I never imported feed. I actually bought it from Waimanalo Feed. And so I just wanna clarify because this is my opportunity to um, to kind of clarify the hearsay stuff, you know, but we've raised like really nice hogs and it's a really disappointment and an upset to me to, to hear that, you know, this whole thing is happening. I mean, I'm devastated just like all you guys, it's a commitment. It's not just something that we can just say, oh yeah, one day we do this and next day we're not. No, it's every day. And I committed myself just like every farm and rancher out there. So I just want to say that, I mean, we, you know, we, we are just farmers trying to, trying to figure out what's wrong. And the cost of it was our whole farm got depopulated we lost everything everything we killed everything and that's all i have to say thank you Stephen. any more questions online or on zoom there are no other raised hands. If there's any others, um, you can click the raise hand button. I see we have one. Um, we have a uh, Jimmy, uh, let me bring him forward. Jimmy Duvichel. Hey, Jimmy. Can, you me, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, hi Doc, how are you doing? Um, I, 
one thing for sure, I am so glad that you guys are gonna do, for the benefit of our people, I think it, it's good that you're gonna um, test as feral, feral animals. I think, um, you know, I, I, I've i been around, I, I worked for Wolof Ranch for 50 years, and I, I saw a lot of these lesions when uh, we were, uh, when we uh, leased Bohook Ranch, I saw a lot of the lesions to know enough to identify one. And I saw that photo uh, you talked about um, from a friend who, who shot that deer. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a doctor, but I'm 90%. That's what, that's the same kind of lesion I see uh, as, uh, you know, uh, TV cattle. But anyway, so I, I'm so glad that you guys are gonna test that the feral animal. And <clears throat> well, I, I actually, I wanted to ask if, if uh, do you think the drought have a lot to do with this or have some uh, influence to um, this uh, disease? Yeah, um, my, my gut feeling is that that is the case. I guess somebody would have to go back and look at the data, you know, the historical data to see what kind of weather pattern we were in um, when we had previous outbreaks. But um, yeah, I think I made a comment on the on the news con um, the news clip that um, basically, in my view, um, something, you know, in my in my view, it's. Uh, while they, we have a wildlife reservoir and it spills back over to the cattle um, when they come in close association with that wildlife reservoir. So specifics beyond that, I don't have, um, but um, yeah, I guess that's the, the theory that, um, that I have that would have to be proven true or false, yeah. So. Well, anyway, I, I, I'm glad that you could, for the safety of our people, uh, I'm so glad you guys are gonna do that. Um, so I think you, you, I got what I wanted to say. Oh, and uh, I wanna be included in that, um, the, the, those fencers, uh, we talked a little bit about um, trying to get, <clears throat> trying to get a bunch of guys together, Molokai people talking, talking about giving our opinions on how we think we can help on the problem. Okay. Appreciate that. Okay, that's it. Okay. Steven, any more raised hands? No, that, that looks like it. Okay, any Dr. Rawson, um, Dr. Maeda, any comments? Hi, Isaac Maeda, Department of Ag. Um, like Dr. Moniz is saying, there's a lot of work to be done. And I hear the frustration. And I understand what's going on with the producers because this is not anything that's simple. And it's kind of like what Dr. Moniz is saying. We cannot be doing the same thing. We've got to try and do something different. So as far as getting information okay. and... I turn. How do you make this closer to that? Try again. Hear me now. Still, still soft. Yeah, I don't know how to make it louder. Some guys was booming. Uh, yeah. They're gonna try adjust. They're gonna try adjust. Better. Let them try to turn up the mic. Okay. So go ahead. To just talk to yeah. you over here. Um, like Dr. Moniz was saying, uh, you know, I can I can hear the frustration in everybody's voice, and I understand what's going on. And it's not a decision that we do that we do just um, easily on our end either. We know the ramifications, but doing what we've been doing and 
just depopulating and not being able to find out what the source of this thing is and not doing something different is not going to get us what we need to do. So having the discussions uh, with, with ranchers and what have you that's necessary. And so these ideas that you've been telling Dr. Muniz is something that we want to we wanna hear. And we also need to, you know, I understand a concern about wildlife and and that situation, but that's something that we need to get a handle on it. And because otherwise we're just basing stuff on um, previous data and we don't have anything that's recent. We don't even have movement data or populations of wildlife and that kind of thing to go on. So there's a lot of work that has to be done on the wildlife side. For us, it's difficult because like Dr. Moniz is saying, we're trying to concentrate on the livestock and the wildlife is is not something that's not our area of um, ability. We don't uh, staffing wise and funding wise. We're always challenged to try and just do what we need to do on the livestock side. So, going forward, we're going to have to try and do this, um, and we have to, like I said, we have to do things a little bit different, and we have to look for fresh ideas and and other things that we can do as well. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, Jason, let me turn my camera on here. Here we go. Reiterate what Ike said and this thinking outside the box, I think it is, is, is it's not a novel approach, but I think it's something we need to take into consideration. And that's everybody on the islands input as well or those that are impacted by the decision well for instance this quarantine order being put in place so i know that has serious impact on folks um willing to and and want to hear ideas the the one thing that i will say in addition to all that is <laughs> for myself this is the last virtual meeting i'm going to intend i intend on being there in person if we're going to do them i had uh, we've all been living these meetings for the past couple of years and and they're difficult to get our points across. Uh, Jason, I applaud you. I uh, didn't really expect that you would be the, say you and Gene would be the sole folks that are representing the government, but uh, great job. I think we need to be there in person next time. And there will be more of these meetings. Thank you. Your questions here. More questions. I um, real fast, Doctor Meniz. I do have. Oh, um, Mrs. Donnelly had raised her hand again, um, but she lowered it. I don't know if she still wants to say something else. Um, it appears she put her hand down. Never mind. I apologize. Okay, I think we have a couple oh, more questions over here. She, she did put it back up. Would you like to take hers or the ones in um, live? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. This is Donnelly, you can- Yes, uh, I just wanna say that, you know, Dr. Moniz has been, he's done his job and he's helped with my farm. And I, and I just wanna say that he's doing the best he can with whatever funding he can work with. And he really is trying to work and help us rancher farmers. And I do wanna say that because he's been very good in moral support, emotional support, and just as a rancher, he understands us. That's all I wanna say. Thank you. More questions over here. tonight because I, have, I was having a discussion with one of the ranchers and I heard that there was concerned about this TV and I didn't know enough. But I gotta tell you, um, I'm happy I came because I'm actually really shocked to be um, honest. I didn't know the problem was that bad. 
uh, because not enough information is being put out in the public. So I'm not here to point fingers or, or to get into the complex issues, because so, this is a complex issue. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this problem since the early, whatever. Um, I wanted to make a couple statements on, our, on the record. Um, who issued the quarantine? The state of Hawaii? Yeah. Okay. So, it was illegal in issuing the quarantine because I consider ranching a cultural practice dating way back to Pandora being So, from a Native Hawaiian perspective, I consider that a cultural practice, ranching and cattle ranching in particular. The state of Hawaii cannot regulate uh, a cultural practice out of existence, and the quarantine does that. So I just wanted to throw it out to you guys to tell you what you guys did with me. Second and third thing is, um, you made a statement tonight that this is highly contagious and it's widespread. I am totally blown away by that statement because I don't see the type of emergency response that would be attached to a statement from the state of Hawaii. I don't know if anybody from USDA APHIS is on this call tonight. I don't know if you guys are, that this is part of the national TV surveillance program that has been in existence with USDA APHIS for what, 50 years? Um, back to 1917 or whatever. So I, I'm really blown away that there's not more happening even prior to the quarantine coming out. No working group was assembled, no consultations with stakeholders or anybody that was affected. I understand the emergency response. Um, but your next steps in your plan tonight is not a plan. It's just a really quickly put together like what we want to do tomorrow. Um, I know what I'm going to do tomorrow. What I'm going to do tomorrow is I'm going to call Senator Schott's office and I'm going to call Basic Ramona's office and I'm going to call Kai Kahele's office because this is on the USDA APEX. We need emergency funds. I know that emergency funds exist for this type of emergency response. And I'm not picking on anybody in particular. I'm just, if I got a call finished tomorrow at the head of the Department of Ag and other, why would the state come out with a broad scale quarantine without doing any outreach inside this community? Even this meeting tonight is substandard. I cannot hear what's going on. There's no information other than a PowerPoint. It's put together very quick and quickly. And that's no excuse. This community deserves more. It really does. Um, we go through this all the time. Just because we live on Molokai doesn't mean this is what we're going to be subjected to. This is an emergency. I am blown away. I am concerned for human health. Am I the pigs and the swine and the whatever, the deer and the cattle? It's a threat to human health. That alone should move the priority up to the top, top, top level within the governor's office. I will call him too tomorrow and I will tell him too. Why are the people of Molokai being subjected to this type of arbitrary, kind of ad hoc, like not comprehensive type of just not planning? And if that is going on behind the scenes, then that's your guys' fault for not sharing it with all of us tonight. So I'm happy I came tonight to see how dire that this is for Molokai. Um, I know a little bit about invasive biology, and so I know what I would do. And I know when I hear things coming up, like if it's one separate sterile area, we know that area got to be predator proof fencing because monkeys could get in on it. You know, people are predator proof fencing. 
in Hawaii. But that's just an action. Yeah, it's not a plan. Yeah. We need a plan for more time. It needs to happen yesterday. It needs to happen very, very quickly. And that's all I got to say. So I want to help you put together this group. Everybody who is signing tonight will be on that group. But you think AFS with all of their expertise and their money, yeah? I just want to look for appropriation. Like that's what I'm asking congressional members to do. Hey, 911, we need $5 million. This is our problem. Who are you going to call? We're going to call up over there. I said, I had a, we will call Kim from Zuma, because there was all this meeting tonight. And then try to get something stuff, help for you. It's not, we're not only picking, I'm not picking on you, Mr. Mm -hmm. I'm only picking on you. But I wanted to thank you, and I wanted to thank the guys. But I know you guys need support, but that's what we can do, yeah? We can rattle everybody's door and get the support we need, because I tell you right now, we need money. And we needed money yesterday. Because nobody going to come over here and pull our hand and help us. Let's take it easy. And cattle ranching is important to this community. So is subsistence hunting. So if we get one disease, we got to take care of it. We got to do what we got to do. We got to do what we got to do. Because nobody will stop eating here tomorrow. And the cattle ranchers is not going to stop ranching. So that's, that's the plan moving forward. Then we, what we're going to do in order to make sure that that can When do you guys want to meet again with your group? I, can, I never get a question. When do you folks want to meet? You, everybody's talking about meeting as a group to put heads together to solve a problem. When do you want to meet? This week. This week. It is Monday. Emergency. It's an emergency. Yes. Yeah. You've been working with us right now. We're working with you guys. Try again. Is USDA AFS? They always work with us. Okay. Yeah. That's where the money will come from. That's why. Yeah, we've asked them. Yeah. So they in on all of this. They know what's going on. Yeah. Step okay. every step of the way. They gotta be on the call. Every separate, they are on the call. So Dr. Rawson is with USDA Veterinary Services. So. He was the last one that spoke. Yeah. He's an area, area veterinarian in charge of um, California, Hawaii, South Pacific. Dr. Rawson worked with Hawaii Department of Agriculture for many years too. So familiar with, uh, he did testing on the side. Okay, so we won't like the fire, yeah? That's everybody's fire. That's, that's our job. We we'll light the fire, and then we we'll hopefully we we'll try to get some resources to you guys. But we need that to happen, like today. Okay. Um, I will need to. I need to decide who besides me gonna be at that meeting from our side, and um, can you guys decide amongst yourself who's gonna come to the meeting, and we'll choose a date. Not gonna be this week, but I'll try to do the following week. And, um, and we work through Gene to try to get a date that works for everybody and find a way to communicate so that like, they get those deals where they send out and uh, you Thank put down what. Okay. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Stephen, if nobody else got any questions on that end, we're going to end the meeting. Okay. Um, there are no others, so that'll be it. All right. Thanks, everybody else who's on the call, on the Thank Zoom call. Thank you.